medically understood. Hey there, folks. Mark Edwards here. And you're watching the Reasoning Aloud YouTube channel and podcast. And today, I am joined by Aaron Rabinowitz. Aaron is a professor of philosophy at Rutgers University, and he is also the host of the Embrace the Void podcast, as well as a co-host of the Philosophers in Space podcast. And Aaron and I spend today's episode talking primarily about ethics. Now, in our day-to-day -day lives, most people don't spend a whole lot of time thinking or talking about ethics, what their ethical positions are, how they arrive at them, that sort of thing. It's just not something that we spend a whole lot of our psychic energy on. But ethics are important. Uh, they largely define how we interact with one another, the, the how and the why of how we interface with our neighbors. In a very real sense, the law is an expression of our ethical principles, uh, how we should treat other people, what the consequences for not treating other people in that way should be. And this is something that's worth spending some time thinking about, uh, as is evident by the fact that there is an entire school of philosophy dedicated to it. And so I wanted to spend some time talking about that subject, and I couldn't have found a better person to have that conversation with. Uh, we first sort of outline our metaphysical positions. Uh, Aaron and I talk about how we think the world, the universe that we live in, is structured. And then we talk about the implications of that on how we both arrive at what our ethical or meta-ethical positions are. Um, Aaron and I actually disagree on this. Uh, Aaron is a moral realist. He believes that morals are real things that exist uh, by virtue of conscious beings existing, whereas I am more of a constructivist. I think that morals and ethics are things that we create ourselves and that we can just sort of have a conversation with one another about which is the better set of systems with relation to other things like conscious well-being and that we kind of build them up as we go along. But despite this disagreement, Aaron and I actually largely share the same normative ideas. We both think that you should be kind to other people. Uh, for instance, we both value personal autonomy. And though we disagree about the foundations, we actually agree largely about how those things should be implemented. And I think that's important uh, because it shows that even if you disagree with somebody about the nature of something, you can still find common ground in how you should behave in the real world, which ultimately I think is the function of ethics, is to help us better interact with our fellow human beings and also non-human animals and, as we discuss in the podcast, trees and volcanoes sometimes and maybe artificial intelligence too later on down the road. So it's definitely something that's worth thinking about, worth talking about, worth having entire podcasts and podcast series about. I think it's very important. And I was really thankful for Aaron coming on and having this conversation with me. Before we get to the episode, I want to give a shout out to all my patrons, whose names will be appearing on the screen now. I want to thank all of you for your continued support. Uh, every day we're getting a little bit closer to making this a sustainable labor of love, uh, and I really appreciate it. If you have the money, if you can spare a dollar or two or ten a month and you enjoy the content that I produce, go on over to patreon.com and become a patron. You'll get your name on the screen with everybody else. And you'll get early access to the audio of all these podcasts, which I post about a week before uh, the YouTube version goes live. And if we get enough of you, I will be able to get a video subscription service, and you will all be able to get the video early as well. So get on over there and donate, become a subscriber, help me out with that, and I will get you something good in return. If you don't have any disposable income, that's okay. I'm not asking you to part with anything that would cause you uh, any level of suffering. Uh, but you can still support the show. You can like, upvote, uh, and give a five-star rating to everything that I produce on all the platforms that I produce it on. Uh, these are all available on YouTube and everywhere that you can get your podcasts. And upvoting and liking and subscribing all that to all that stuff 
really does help me out. It boosts me in the algorithm and it gets the word out uh, about the content that I'm producing here. So that is also a good way to help the show. Be sure to subscribe to the second channel, which you'll find at the bottom of the main page called RA Clips. That is where I upload clips of all of these shows. In case you don't have time to watch the full thing, you can just check out the highlights. You can also find me on Twitch, where I stream Stardew Valley and have a good wholesome time when I get home from work sometimes, usually at least once or twice a week. You can also follow me on Twitter, uh, at Reasoning Aloud, and I'm also on Facebook, though less frequently. And you can also follow me on Instagram, where I post pictures of my cat and nothing else, just as God intended. And without any further delay, I give you Aaron Rabinowitz. Aaron Rabinowitz, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, we are here to talk about all things void, and you mm -hmm. are an expert. Uh, so I'm happy to have you on the show. Um, a mere supplicant, we'll say, but thank you so much for having me on. Um, I thought that we'd start by just going over our meta-ethical position, or our metaphysical, and then our meta-ethical positions, and then kind of go from there as to how we use those to interface with the world. Um, does that sound good? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I will kick it to you first. Yeah. So I'm not a metaphysician first and foremost. I think it's worth saying, right? I am primarily interested in ethics and that brings with it interest in um, meta ethics and especially the nature of personhood, which then it pulls you into metaphysical territory. Um, so I would say, you know, I, I do metaphysics as reluctantly as I do epistemology. Um, you know, I avoid it whenever possible. Um, but generally speaking, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I live somewhere in the world of like monism, like, like non-reductive monism or something like some, some method by which we want to say that there are, um, mental and physical things in the world. And the mental things don't easily reduce down to the physical things um, and should be treated differently. Um, and that's uh, th there's no easy metaphysics to get you all of those things together. Um, but I, I think I'm somewhere in the world of like there's one underlying physical sub, you know, un underlying substance of some sort and then a bunch of properties um, and the relationship between those properties and the substance is beyond my understanding. Okay. Um, so when you say that the, the, the thinky bits do not reduce down into the physical, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, and this, again, immediately you start to have problems, right? But I think the, the idea would be, um, you know, one way you could go about this is saying there are, like, these are... Um, non-physical properties that are instantiated in that emerge from physical systems. So I don't I don't take the route of the panpsychists and saying that like it can't be the case that consciousness could emerge as we understand it. So it has to be there fundamentally in the beginnings of the universe or something. Um I think it's the case that it does emerge, but emergence is another whole bucket of problems. Um but basically right. that it emerges in such a way where it has properties that are not reducible to the properties of the constitutive parts. So the one that is most significant to me as a philosopher is um, subjectivity, the way that your first person experience is fundamentally subjective in the sense of being given directly to you and you're experiencing it. Um, in such a way that no amount of description of the objective features of reality could fully capture what it is that you are experiencing. Okay. So I think I agree with most or almost all of that. Uh, the thing, and, and reduction is kind of a, a, it's something I'm curious about. I don't know mm -hmm. a lot. I don't even know how to articulate an appropriate argument one way or the other, but my instincts are, and actually I'll just, I'll give you sort of my elevator pitch for my metaphysics, and then we can talk about that reduction thing, because I think it mm -hmm. more easily maps onto that. Um, 
I actually like the way that uh, Sean Carroll describes himself as a materialist. I think that sums up my views very well and very shortly, which is there is stuff, right? There's matter and energy, and then that stuff conforms to certain predictable behaviors that we call the laws of physics. And that statement is a complete description of our universe. You don't need anything else to describe the world that we live in. Uh, and everything that we experience uh, is an emergent property of various sub-layers of abstraction up from that. So you have the stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, you can talk about a fundamental existence, right? The, the layer of like the of quantum mechanics, right? That's real, that's base layer reality, but it's equally coherent to talk about a system of chemistry. And at the level of chemistry, there's not a lot of uh, distinction between, say, a chair and its surrounding environment, but at the layer that we interact with the world, it's very coherent to talk about a chair. Mm -hmm. You don't even need to understand chemistry to talk about it. It's a physical object that's there that you can interact with. And then above that, there's uh, social constructs that arise out of the interaction of people like you and I, where our experience is an emergent property of those other physical things. So that's mm -hmm. kind of where mm -hmm. I fall with it. Um, but in that, there is no room for or no need for anything that you would call supernatural. Uh huh. Yeah, I don't think that I'm, I'm I'm claiming something supernatural. Here's what I think I'm right. I want to claim. Right, we do have a sense at which, while it might be true that I could give a sufficient account of the universe at the quantum physics level that would capture and predict all kinds of phenomenal behavior at more sophisticated levels like chemistry or biology or something like that. I mean, I think first of all, we have to say it's not going to be the most useful or functional account, right? Like you were saying, an account that talks about things at the level of biology and chemistry is better than one that only talks about it at the level of quantum physics. But I also think that there is something fundamentally different about the jump from one kind of one level of non-conscious complexity to another level of non-conscious complexity versus the jump from non-conscious to conscious levels of complexity so there is a way that okay. i think you can fully describe the chair without appeal to subjectivity in a way that you can't fully describe yourself without appeal to subjectivity and subjectivity is weird in a way that all of the properties of a chair are not weird, I think. Gotcha. Um, so, right, I wasn't trying to, I'm not trying to characterize your view as super. No, yeah, I actually yeah, for sure. Think, yeah, um, I think uh, everything that you just described actually maps neatly onto what I also think. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually agree with you that there is some, there is something to there subjectivity that is not neatly captured in that way um, mm -hmm. which is what makes it so interesting and important um, right. whether or not that's just a bias that we have by being creatures with subjectivity uh, I don't know but I wonder if mm -hmm. let me give you an example so um, let's say we can't reduce our conscious experience to a to any level of material description that's a is that a claim that you're making? Okay. Yeah, that it would be sufficient. Yeah, I think that I want to make that claim. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, would it not be fair to say that the full accounting of the arrangement of every particle of matter in my brain and what it is doing at the moment I'm experiencing a subjective thought is not an accurate reduction? Like, just because it's not compact? is it still not an adequate descriptor of that that subjective event yeah experience? i think i think what i what i end up wanting to say is it's not a sufficient it's not a complete description of all of the features of the subjective experience including its most important feature which is that subjective what it's likeness in this kind of way now it may be the case that you if you were having a you know a sufficiently advanced computer 
and that like it was good enough at quantum physics, maybe it could predict my behavior with a high degree of accuracy. That wouldn't actually mm -hmm. surprise me or worry me that much as a free will denier. Um, but I don't I don't think that it would be able to give you a full account of what it's like to be me. I think it would have to be doing some sort of um predictive gap closing um to make up for its inability to fully characterize sort of the subjective in that way. Okay. Um and so I don't know that I even know enough to disagree with that. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm I'm actually fairly agnostic on this point um, because I, I do think that there is something to interrogating the subjective in that way. Mm -hmm. So like uh, my, my education on this comes from reading like a few of Nagel's papers and uh, a few other people. Um, like mm -hmm. I think that there is some, something to what it is like to be a thing mm -hmm. that I might not be able to convey in a reductive way, but I don't think that there's anything extra beyond the this arrangement of things that put that into being that is there. There's no, um, you're not going to find a soul in that. Right. If right. that, right. Um, and it, go ahead. Yeah, no, I mean, and this, and this is, you know, getting right to the heart. Like I, like I said at the beginning, right, no metaphysical theory is good or sufficient. We can just choose between the various bad ones with their various problems. And you're putting your finger right on the problem here, which is if, like, if you really want to say there's just the material world, um, but that it has certain things that are in it that don't reduce down to its fundamental sort of atomic level in this kind of way, then then things get weird right you're describing some sort of emergence right. um that is it, it, you, so one way to put this would be if it really emerges from the thing then it seems weird that it couldn't be reducible back down to the thing um and so the non-reductive materialist is in a bit of a weird spot in claiming that it can't be fully reduced back down that way um but i just i think that every view ends with certain weird problems and this is just the bullet that i choose to bite i think fair enough uh i don't know if i'll bite it with you <laughs> um but i uh i certainly understand your position uh i i have sympathy for it because it is a weird thing that we have right this this self referential perception of being that you know it's and what is mm -hmm. that, right? The debate about what that is and consciousness. I'm, I'm kind of a oh, fan the hard problem. Of the uh, idea. Yeah, yeah, and this is I, I, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, yeah, no, I just wanted. It's a good point because I wanted to mention this earlier when you were talking about this, right? To me, one way to understand the hard problem of consciousness is why is this emergence different from all other emergences, right? Like, why is the emergence of consciousness fundamentally weird in a way that the emergence of everything else? from quantum physics is not to me the same kind of weird and I, I guess i'm i'm very thoroughly convinced by folks like nagel that it does have a unique kind of weirdness to it which makes it impossible to understand it via allegory between you know particle physics versus chemistry that when you're doing comparisons to two non-conscious states of reality Right, you're not understanding the problem of the jump from the non-conscious to the conscious. Yeah, I um. So there, I have two minds about this. Right, mm -hmm. the the hard problem. Um, on the one hand, I there's part of me that's very sympathetic to the idea that, regardless of what we eventually find, that it's probably just emptiness all the way down. That consciousness isn't doing anything. Mm. that it's a factory without workers so to speak like there's just bits and pieces moving around without an agent present at any, at bottom of it it's not like this cartesian thing it's just mm -hmm. there's just subjectivity that's arising out of what our brains happen to be doing mm -hmm. and that that wasn't uh evolutionarily detrimental and so we just kept it for whatever reason um but i i i don't know that i'm it doesn't seem like it's doing anything on its own or that we're likely to find a doer within it if we interrogate it all the way to bottom. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that it's not, that there's not, uh, uh, that doesn't mean that or 
that doesn't imply an absence of experience as a thing that exists. It just implies right. that there's some sort of like non-dual connection between the experience and the experiencer, um, which is the other side of that, which is an idea I had many years ago when I was on a lot of drugs, <laughs> which is mm. that uh, there actually is no difference between sense and sensation that what we think of is like there is no there might not be any actual difference between uh a measurement and the experience of the measure so mm -hmm. dennett's thermostat might very well be conscious at a very reduced and like poor way i don't know how you'd prove that i don't even know if it's a good argument but it's just something that i kick around from time to time and it seems as plausible as anything else that i've come across so i end up thinking that the like Dennett thermostat example is a reductio ad absurdum of the the illusionist view um i think that if your theory can't distinguish between me and a thermostat then it's not a very good theory of consciousness just like broadly <laughs> speaking right like i think you've missed the mark on what you're what you're trying to talk about here um so i also you know, there is a possibility that what you're describing is the case, which is um, I, I understand this to be the epi epiphenomenal view, which is the idea that conscious states emerge kind of like fireworks in our mind. They don't do anything. They're just like a side effect of other processes that actually do things. And we experience mm -hmm. them and we create a narrative that tells us that like um, the causal map, the causal you know path goes via the phenomenal experience and then back into reality after we've acted like as you say as we sort of like the cartesian self has experienced and chosen a reaction or something like that um i don't you know the reason i don't ultimately buy the epiphenomenalism view is i think that phenomenal consciousness is causally effective what i don't think exists is a robustly independent self so i sort of in a weird mixed mm. buddhist kind of view i think there's a cartesian theater and I think there's someone in the Cartesian theater experiencing themselves as being the observer, but they're just a very robust illusion. And that like part of our job is to mm -hmm. break them down as an illusion. But even as we break them down, as you would say, right, the phenomenal experience itself doesn't go away. Um, we just become less attached to it, less identified with it in certain kinds of ways. Um, but I think... I think ultimately pure witnessing consciousness doesn't go away and is sort of fundamental to what we understand to be experience and, and reality. Um, and I don't think we can, I mean, I, like, I think that has a weird causal relationship with the world that I will never probably fully understand, but I think it is a genuine causal relationship where physical states impact mental states and mental states then impact physical states. So I, I would agree that it has a causal relationship with the world. I just don't know that I'm convinced by the idea that there's an actual observer. I would be more sympathetic to everything you just said if we could if the theater itself was the observer, that there was no actual like different like you're you're talking about there being an observer and I don't see a need for that. We can just have the theater experiencing itself as well as the projection that it's showing. Yeah. No, I, mean, uh, I think you that... could argue that's the ultimate place you're trying to get to is recognizing yeah. that like the observer is part of the theater and is constructed alongside the theater and like both it and the theater are kind of weird abstractions in this way. Um, as long as we sort of recognize that, recognize these two claims right which is phenomenal states exist and they are given in a direct first personal way to something right there's something that's doing the experiencing even if that thing is not a independent radically free self but rather just the part of the flux that we you know cleave off and identify as the self yeah i i don't think that i would i think i would sign off on that mm -hmm. um and what that ultimately shakes out to is a matter of debate, and I'm probably not competent enough to participate in the nitty gritty of the debate. But me would it neither. be fair to say, <laughs> well, you're far more than me? <laughs> um, would it be? Uh, you got a couple letters after your name. I don't have. <laughs> um, <laughs> they mean they mean it... very little. But yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. I'm going to put that. That's going to be the tagline of the show. Okay. Um, <laughs> would uh would it be fair to say though that 
regardless of any of this, that you and I both agree that the phenomenon of the experience that it is like something to be us is purely at bottom an emergence out of the physical and what we describe as the natural world. Yeah, I think so. Like, if by physical we mean the objective, and then this gives it into another like tricky distinction, right? Like, if we're talking about like the subjective versus the objective, right? I think if we want, if we want to say by the physical we mean the parts of reality that can be described sufficiently using purely objective language and concepts and descriptions and such like that, then yeah, I think the subjective emerges out of the objective um, and is part of the objective. And even like weirder, like I think some of our mental, like we can make, we can make objective claims about our subjective mental states in various kinds of ways. Um, but yes, I think ultimately, I mean, let me say, you know, there's, there are interesting views that could say that like, what we think of as the objective and the subjective are both abstractions away from whatever the true undifferentiated reality actually is or something like that. In which case, you know, then we might want to say that like subjective and objective are both properties of an underlying Spinozan like substance or whatever that isn't itself either objective or subjective. It has neither of these properties I'm sympathetic to it, like an approach like that, um, potentially, but I think maybe at the ultimately at the end of the day, it's not going to be fundamentally that different from what I think like a non-reductive materialist has in mind. Okay, so, so it would be fair then, though, to say that you don't think that there's anything else going on underneath it than neurochemistry. Or, or no, no, I some, think the substrate, yeah, the of... substrate in which our consciousness exists is neurochemistry. Okay, um, good. And uh, I think that we're both aligned there, certainly. Um, so that puts us in an interesting position as conscious beings on a physical substrate without anything outside of that mm -hmm. impinging on us to compel us one way or another to behave towards the rest of the universe or each other or ourselves mm -hmm. which brings us to how do we figure how we should do that what are what are our meta ethics mm -hmm. in that world where there is just neurochemistry with uh experience and subjectivity on top of it how do you arrive at ethical ideas from that right and th this is where I, I feel slightly better ground, um, but my answers may even be weirder. <laughs> um, you know, Good. I'll say be like weird. I, I mean, my view at this point is basically like moral properties, moral truths are emergent claims and properties of the universe alongside consciousness. So like it is the case that one objectively ought not to cause unnecessary suffering to conscious beings. And that, to me, is a claim about what we ought to do in the sort of universe that we exist in. Um, and it draws its justifications on parts of the universe themselves and is not a matter of mere preference or desire or you know, subjective agreement between conscious entities. Um, so while I don't think there's anything out there besides, you know, the physical quote unquote, one of the things that I think emerges from the physical right alongside consciousness is objective moral claims about how you ought to treat conscious entities and how you ought to treat non-conscious entities, I think. Okay. Uh, how... How do those objective claims arise alongside consciousness? Like, what is the the mechanism by which that occurs? Yeah, so I think it's very, we would be very, very careful here to not reify these things in a way that suggests that they emerge like a physical phenomenon or something like that. It'd be sort of like, and it's more like in my mind thinking, you know, and again, I'll probably stray back into terrible territory here for me here, but like, the, the speed of light, right? 
the speed of light apply is, is is it like you were saying with um carol right is a um a reliable description of the behavior of certain things in our reality right it's a descriptor that applies to those things if they didn't exist in our reality would that still be the speed of light i think maybe not right or maybe it's the case that like all things and all realities follow that same basic speed of light or something like that but it still seems to me that like what you just have there is a claim that is true when there are things in the universe that it applies to accurately right so we could say you know with the big bang does this the, 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 let me put it this way right does the speed of light sort of pop into existence with the big bang does it precede the big bang um those sorts of questions I, I think similar things could be said about um ethics and what exists in the universe right so if you have some some might argue for example that if you have a universe that has no conscious entities in it whatsoever right then there'd be no morality in that universe it wouldn't matter if the universe blinked into or out of existence at any given moment um I'm I'm a little ambivalent. I'm a little uncertain on that kind of claim. Um, but I, I think there could at least be something there. And for our purposes, right, let's just we'll just set aside other meta ethical concerns for a second and just talk about sentient beings and their suffering. Right. If you think that all ethics and value is attached to the to conscious entities and their well being, um, then I think you might say you know, the universe prior to the existence of conscious entities has no moral valence one way or the other. Or you could say, insofar as certain choices are likely to bring about consciousness, maybe they are ethically, you know, moral or immoral, even in that time prior to the emergence of consciousness. But certainly once there are conscious beings in the universe, certain moral claims about how you ought to treat them necessarily apply and they emerge in the sense that, like, when the conscious beings are there, the principles about how you ought to treat them are also there. Um, a a as, like, you know, law-like descriptions about how you ought to behave towards conscious entities. Does that okay. make, any, make any sense? <laughs> no, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. I uh -huh. think you're one layer back from me in that stratification okay. of, like, base physical reality abstracting into higher order phenomenon abstracting into the chair um into us and then there's conscious creatures who mm -hmm. have certain instincts and behavior that they are want to do and then we create other layers on top of our consciousness which is the world of social constructs like governments and gender and money Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that it's perfectly coherent to describe a state or a dollar bill or male, female, non-binary as real things mm -hmm. in the same way we would describe a chair as real because we interact with them in a way that affects us meaningfully. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but it would not be coherent to describe them as the same level of reality. One abstracts into the other. Mm -hmm. And what I would say is that the place of morals is it arises in kind of a liminal space between where we live as conscious beings and the things that we create. So it's mm -hmm. a layer back from states and gender and money, but it's not quite at the level of the chair or neurochemistry. And mm, I don't mm -hmm. think that there are objective moral truths that exist in the universe that like a kind of like a platonic ideal that we could compare our truths to but if we set certain axiomatic goals like mm -hmm. we prioritize the well-being of conscious creatures then it becomes perfectly reasonable to say some things are better at achieving that than others and even though we invent our ethics, it's perfectly reasonable for me to try to convince you that mine are better with relation to that goal. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yeah, so a few things there. There are views that are called like intersubjective views that say, you know, morality is neither purely objective nor purely subjective. It's some sort of intersubjective thing. Um, I, my personal view is it, those views are ultimately unstable, and they either 
either they commit to the claim that certain moral truths are in objective in the sense that I think is important, which is independent of our beliefs about them, or they collapse into just subjectivity. So I don't I don't think that there is a uh, sustainable position there. Um, now, re regarding like things like society and such, my under my sense of it is that we have two we have two important questions here in meta ethics at least right one of them is the grounding question what grounds our meta ethical claims right what makes our moral claims true or false and the other is how do we get access to that knowledge right what is the mechanism by which real individuals like you or i have any hope of gaining access to moral truths right and there i think mm -hmm. the process is via a lot of social interaction and debate and stuff like that um those kinds of methods but what I think is important is the methods that give us access to the truth are not the same things that ground the truth itself. That the moral truths are independent of our access to them in a robust way. And that allows it to be the case that we could, as a society, for example, fail to grasp those moral truths and have them still be true, even as we as a species mm -hmm. go about doing the wrong thing for you know, as our entire history, for example. Um, so yeah, to me, they are independent in the sense of being independent of any individual's beliefs about them. So it's, it's wrong to call, you know, ha to keep humans as slaves. Um, even if everyone in the world, including the slaves themselves have been brainwashed into believing that it's actually good to keep slaves, right? That's, that to me is what makes hmm. it objective and sort of independent of our minds in this weird kind of way so i would say that it's an ob objectively true that it's bad to have slaves if you value human well-being um right okay right so and good. it so, seems it, mm -hmm. so it seems like you're pushing the idea that valuing the well-being of things that are capable of experiencing well-being is on its own a sort of ethical truth that impinges on us yep. before any before we even start the conversation exactly and right i don't know that i'm willing to sign off on that but uh -huh. I, I i'm curious if you can explain uh like how, how does that how does that truth exist like objectively in the universe is, is it separate from us? Does it arrive via us? Like, what is it and our relationship to it in this view? So again, I think it's much like the speed of light in that it exists, mm -hmm. but it isn't like a thing out there existing. It's a description, right? But it's okay. a description. So you, you mentioned earlier that you think that like, you know, we have to accept certain axioms as true. And then from there, our ethics can follow. And my view, I think, mm -hmm. is certain axiomatic objective ethical claims are true and it's not that we construct them mm -hmm. or imbue them with truth it's that we recognize that they are true we discover them as such um so like things like all okay. things you know all things being equal you ought to respect autonomy you ought to promote flourishing you ought to reduce suffering you ought to enforce rights all those sorts of things to me and, and this is like Maybe I'm just a very basic philosopher, I'll be honest. I just, I take a simple kind of foundationalist approach to this and say, you know, I can unpack the meaning of those statements more and try to help you understand why I think they are axiomatically true. Um, but like, you know, I don't expect to be able to convince everybody that they are axiomatically true, nor do I think I have to be able to. I think that people are just going to be wrong about moral truths just like they are wrong about non-moral truths like that like there's no there's no evidence there's no justification i think for claiming that for something to be an objective truth you have to be able to even in principle <laughs> convince everybody that it's actually true um so i don't think that's a necessary criteria yeah would it be fair to say though that if something were objectively true that you should in principle be able to adjudicate whether it's true or not not i don't i don't, I don't think necessarily <laughs> So, like, it, if, if something is true, would it not follow that there is should be, at least in principle, whether or not you actually have the material means to do it, just in principle, you could arrive at an understanding of that truth, you could acquire that information, or you could observe it in some way, 
so should I, that I, not be a property of truth? Well, what I would say about it, I, I, first of all, right, it depends on, like, we may just be very screwed, right, when it comes to epistemology, <laughs> right? It may just be the case that, like, truths, broadly speaking, are not very accessible or not at all accessible to us as human beings, and they might still be true. Like, to me, I think access and truth come apart in this kind of way. Um, I, I'm sure there are epistemologists who will disagree with me about that, but um, yeah, I think... I, I think, look, what I, what I should be able to do is I should be able to explain the meaning of all of the concepts involved in one of these axiomatic moral claims, um, point to the way that they correspond to features of reality, give examples of the way that this principle plays out in reality, show that it is always true in every situation that we can imagine. Those sorts of activities, I think, are the best that you will get in terms of, you know, the process of conveying and convincing other people about an ethical truth or something like that. And I think that's, I think that's fine. Like, I think, I, you know, we, I wish we, I, much, I much, would much prefer if we could build a machine and it would like spit out a note card that says this moral claim is true, this moral claim is false. Um, but I wouldn't. I don't think we would ever be able to do that or necessarily rely on that machine's judgment solely. That gets into fun superintelligence AI questions. But like, uh, yeah, sorry. I think I think we shouldn't assume that something being an objective truth implies anything about our ability to concoct a sufficient account of that truth that it will, in principle, be compelling to everyone. So, so not necessarily that it would be compelling to everybody, but just that we could, in principle, arrive at an just any like any one human being mm -hmm. could, in theory, ar arrive at an understanding of it in some way, mm -hmm. um, in a way that is concrete and objective. Um, e not yeah. so much that we can convince everybody of it, but that it remains possible to, in theory, know that truth in a not in a uh, non falsifiable way. So, um, yeah, not even whether or not we would ever have access to that, the, that ability. And it couldn't, uh, uh -huh. not necessarily like a machine, but it could be a rhetorical strategy or a philosophical technology that we use to get at it. But there should in principle be some way that we can say, just as the speed of light is this over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. this is a true feature of a universe with conscious beings in it and i don't see how we would do that with morals and and that's where i i have a hang up about it because let let me let me make a moral claim here okay i think that the well-being of conscious creatures is something that we should value at a fundamental level uh i don't have a objective reason for that I could try to convince you of it one way or the other, but at the end of the day, it's a thing that I think we should care about, and I, mm -hmm. that's all I got. Mm -hmm. And I'm perfectly okay with that, and I'm perfectly okay saying the Nazis were bad, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I, I may not be able to give you a hard and fast moral objective truth at bottom of that, but that doesn't concern me very much because I've told you what my axioms are and everything else follows from that. I don't need them to be grounded in some other truth. And I'm willing to make, I'm willing to grant that they might be, but I, I feel like I would need, need a way to, to put some oomph behind that. Right. <laughs> like how would I, how would I do that? Okay. Well, let me, let me understand your view on the Nazis here a little bit better. Um, okay. You know, when you say you think the Nazis are bad, it sounds to me like what you're saying, based on what you just described, is you're saying, if you agree with me about certain fundamental ethical principles, then you ought to think they are bad as well. Is that correct? Yeah, that's the that's the extent of my right. But you don't you don't that think that people should necessarily agree with you about those, or, or at least that you feel like you don't have a way to make a case that everybody should agree with you about the principles that get you to that conclusion. Is that sort of where so you're at? I would, be, I would be happy to try to convince people of it, and I think I have good arguments for it. Mm -hmm. Or I think that a bunch of people smarter than me could make better arguments than even me about why those things are bad. Mm -hmm. But I don't feel as though I have any truly objective grounding and why I should 
so it all comes back down to i don't think that we should immiserate things that are capable of experiencing misery i don't have an objective reason to feel that way that's just the way that i feel yeah so i I I guess that you're saying mm -hmm. that there is an objective reason to feel that way is that where yeah exactly i take the view that like there are things towards which you should correctly feel that's good and things towards which you should correctly feel that's bad right to even use Ma- reclaim the the language that like Mackie used when he made fun of us. Um, you know, I think suffering has to be avoided and is built into it. Like that's a, like a fundamental feature of suffering is that it is to be avoided. So if there's like something that is going to produce suffering and it won't produce any ju- you know justification for producing that suffering, then like that fact, which to me to- seems to be you know a fact of the matter about reality, right? That that fact compels you it has a moral obligation built into it um so if you know for example right that like child labor is bad for children right it stunts their growth it it increases the risk of physical harm or something like that right all of which seem to me to be empirically testable claims about the impact of an activity Mm -hmm. on these individuals right if you can make those assessments then you already have everything you need to make the correct moral claim about um about child labor right you don't need some further personal preference that says well i think that suffering is bad and they're like in in the like the simple human kind of way of you know i have this fact of child labor and my desire about child labor and they run themselves together and create my moral obligation right I and and like I think there's some justification for thinking Hume actually believed something like this too, you know. Think it's more like I observe that there is child labor and that it causes suffering, and if I am properly habituated as a moral observer, I will I will cognize that this instills in me an obligation not to not to engage and not to allow and to prohibit child labor, Um, and my desires much like society may give me greater access to that knowledge they may you know if i'm lucky i've been raised in such a way where my emotional reactions will help me correctly track the moral truth um but they are not the foundation the grounding of that moral truth so i i don't disagree with really anything that you've said right i think you and i Mm -hmm. would probably arrive at the same prescriptions for action in most cases uh i just Mm -hmm. i just don't feel compelled or i i don't find it i don't know there's just i don't know that there's a the thing that i would call an axiom you seem to you're you're calling objective truth and i Mm -hmm. think i'm just not ready to make that leap and i don't have much of a problem with that nor actually do i see why i should like why is just having it as an axiom not enough well first of all i think it's you know it's setting aside the utility of how we characterize it i think it's just false to say that it's purely axiomatic in the sense that your acceptance of it is is unmotivated do you know what i mean like the way you sort of describe it it's like you voluntarily acquiesce to a moral axiom and then act based on it. Um, And I think it would be reasonable to ask why you voluntarily acquiesce to any one axiom over another. And with enough digging, I think we would eventually find that like you recognize that there's a fundamental value to certain axioms and their products over other axioms. um, And that there's reason to choose your axioms over the axioms of a Nazi, for example. Um, but if if you don't sort of adopt my view, I think um, at the ultimately at the end of the day, you have to say, you know, if everybody in the world was a Nazi and thought that Nazism was correct, that there wouldn't be anything wrong with being a Nazi in that world. And I think that's a reductio ad absurdum of the anti-realist position or of the the subjectivist position that you really just you when you say I think the Nazis are bad. What you have to ultimately admit you're saying is uh, the Nazis conflict with my axioms, but those axioms don't necessarily apply to them. So I'm not sure I can say they're doing anything wrong so much as doing something that I personally don't like. 
Right. And I would I would try to convince those Nazis that the way that they are living their life is not the best way to maximize their own well-being. And if somebody tells me that they're not interested in their own well-being, I, I don't know. I, that is a point at which I'm no longer capable of having a conversation with them. And I, I actually don't feel any mm -hmm. uh, nausea over just disregarding that person at that point. So you think, first uh, of like all, I, that you think everybody has an oblig everybody should care about their own well-being? Or are you just saying it's not worth talking I think that, to somebody who doesn't? I don't think that they should. I think that most people do. And the people that don't are not going to probably, are likely, unlikely to get on board with anything I have to say ethically. Okay, so let, let me play um, Nazi I, advocate here for a second, right? Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm with you on the, let's care about our own self-interest. I, as a Nazi, care very deeply about the interest of the motherland and the white race and all such things, right? And I am going about enacting what seems to me to be the correct behavior for based on that kind of caring, right? I think you would still want to tell me I was enacting that principle very, very poorly in an objective kind of way, not in a like subjective agree to disagree kind of way, right? So I would say that your belief in wanting a strong motherland and et cetera, et cetera, for the white race are seem to me to be heavily rooted in a desire to enhance the well-being of you and your people. And I would say that those ideas are a objectively bad way to get what you want. Okay. So, so they're bad in relation to the thing you want, which is a thing we both share. Right. And I think they're, I mean, here's what I'll say. You know, I think you're going to find just as much intractable disagreement at the applied and normative level of, as you are at the meta ethical level, right? So it's going to be the case that, like, they're just going, you know, they're just going to like say agree to disagree, right? And like, yeah. I'm not convinced that you could con you could compel them, you could present an argument that would be remotely compelling to them in that situation because it's going to be based on you know claims like you think a multicultural society is better than a homogenous society. And they're going to say, I don't think that. Um, and like, I, you know, I, what I will say is I don't think the anti-realists have any better way of dealing with moral disagreement than the realists. In fact, I think they have a much worse time trying to deal with it. Whereas I think that I can comfortably say, you know, what, what the Nazis get wrong is um, a lot of foundational meta-ethical stuff as well as a lot of applied meta-ethical stuff. Um, and they get it wrong in, in the same way that like a sociopath who kills people gets morality wrong, right? It's not just a difference in, in axioms or a difference of agreement or something like that. They are failing to cognize reality, right? They are missing a key feature of reality. They are equivalent of being, um, you know, colorblind or something like that. Interesting. Um, yeah, I, I, I see what you're saying. I, I just am, I, it's, it's not something I've been moved on, but mm -hmm. I do understand your argument. And I think what's important here is that regardless of our positions and the durability and stability of them, we both think the Nazis were bad. Yeah. And that gets, that gets weird, right? Cause I, I think some folks will say, well, look, if we all just agree the Nazis are bad, why do we have to do all this meta ethics? Who cares? If it's like mm -hmm. subjective or objective, I think it matters, though, because I think a lot of a, a variety of things, some of which maybe necessarily shouldn't, but do hang on whether we see morality as objective or subjective. I think psychologically, if you tell human beings that morality is objective, they will behave in response to it differently than if you tell them that it's subjective. And I, I've seen this a lot with, you know, rationalist folks online who will in response to a, here is your moral obligation, they will say, well, morality is just subjective, so I don't have to care about what you think about it, right? Like, I'm not, I don't have to be compelled by other people's preferences on the moral landscape. Um, and that, I think, is a real problem for a subjective-based morality, even one that tries to bootstrap its way up towards objectivity. Um, now, look, you know, that person is probably not going to be any more compelled from me telling them that it's a foundational objective moral truth that they can cognize if they, you know, habituate themselves properly. Um, but I think that is the truth. I think that is the world. Um, and I think most people are able to get to that place 
especially if they're started off in the right direction early enough. Um, you know, and it's hard. I, I don't think that you can prove moral truths in the way that you can prove scientific truths. Like, I don't think mm. we can test a foundational moral claim in the same way that we can test the speed of light. Um, but I think we can uh, assemble sufficient argumentation and evidence that we can be thoroughly confident that some of like the moral foundations that I believe in are true. And then like the hard work of ethics is some of those foundations contradict each other, right? They, or they conflict with each other, like in the sense of like, um, you know, when I, you know, when we're, we're dealing with an applied problem, like internet freedom, right? What are you allowed to say on the internet? Right. You have a tension between your moral foundation of personal freedom and your moral foundation of, um, you know, building a safe, healthy community for everybody as opposed to a, a lawless hellscape or something like that, right? And so you balance those things and different people are going to come to different conclusions about where the balance is. And I'm a pluralist about that. So I think someone might be right if they decide that they want X amount of content moderation versus Y amount of content moderation. And I think as long as they're not ending up in a place where they believe in absolute content moderation or zero content moderation, there are a couple of potential right answers in the spectrum there. Um, so I think you can actually have some amount of permanent ethical disagreement that is good and healthy and compatible with the kind of objectivism that I have in mind. Mm -hmm. So would it be fair to say that with your, your outlook here, Mm -hmm. that let's let's just take the content moderation policy because that's sure. a that's an an interesting and good one there are at bottom objective ethical truths mm -hmm. and then we should be able to from that extrapolate a solution set to individual problems like content moderation that is a that is objectively true because it is you know whatever sort of calculus you use to arrive mm -hmm. at it from your initial uh from your initial presumptions it you can follow that chain that algorithm very reasonably mm -hmm. better than the alternatives that at not, least i'll say right we, we don't know if we want to yeah, go so far and, as to say right but like yeah go ahead does that not mm -hmm. does that not imply that there would be a single optimal solution i don't think so necessarily um okay. and the reason is because i think if you were to say like for there to be an optimal solution, I think you would have to, it would have to be the case that you could in theory construct a hierarchy of the foundational moral truths that says, you know, in cases where justice and mercy or intention pick justice over mercy or something like that, or like a waiting system or something. But I don't, I don't really think it ultimately works that way. I think it's a little fuzzier than that. Um, I think, uh, you know, so it's like the content moderation um, example. I think it's objectively the true, right, that Twitter is better without Alex Jones and Donald Trump on there. Now, what should we do about QAnoners? That might be a little more fuzzy, right? It might be the case that when you start to shade into certain kinds of group organizations, you know, how do you, where do you draw the exact line? It, there may not be a perfect right answer. There may be, here's this line and the trade-offs for that line. Here's this line and the trade-offs for that line. You know, each one will, you'll have a list of hard cases, you know, or even like a list of like, this is a case that's more than likely going to be wrongly decided and we have to accept that cost, right? Or something like that. Um, and so I think ultimately at the end of the day in that, in that area, in that spectrum of possible right lines, there is no, there is not necessarily a rightist line. And this actually gets into some really weird stuff that I learned about in um, Larry Temkin's class about like spectrums of uh, responses to moral problems where it may be the case, where there may be weird transitivity issues that make it the case that no one line is actually the ultimately true right line. There are just several true. So another example of this is um, that I used for a paper was 
you know, you have money that you can put towards curing a disease, right? So you try to figure out which disease should I try to cure? And you have a whole spectrum of diseases ranked by severity and the amount of people that they impact, right? And you have on one end of the spectrum, very, very common diseases that have very, very low impact, but they have it on lots of people, right? So like skin dermatitis or something like that. And on the other hand, you have like horrible Ebola, you know, something really, really severe, but that doesn't affect that many people in the world at a given point in time. Um, and then in between you have malaria and all the other sorts of things, right? Where on mm -hmm. that spectrum is the actual disease that is the optimal disease for you to you know, allocate your resources to, right? I think the answer is it's somewhere in the middle of that spectrum, you know, but it could be any number of things from malaria to yellow fever or something like that, depending on like what, what actually is in that sort of moderate range of affects a fair number of people, affects them fairly severely, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So I'm actually very comfortable with the fuzziness mm -hmm. uh, that I, I, I like the, I like the fuzzy uh, when people start giving me hard uh, moral truths that have to be followed. I get nervous and I usually leave. Uh, so mm -hmm. I'm glad that fair. we, we agree on the fuzzy. Um, would it be fair then to say that there's not going to, that there's not going to be like some ob true sort of utilitarian hedonic calculus that exists that we could ever use that is that's not something that's probably compatible with your view that we're more likely to have because this is what i think yeah. like irrespective of our disagreements about uh the foundations of it i think that our ethics are something that we or at least the uh practical applications of our ethics are things that are just going to be messy conversations we have until the heat death of the universe that we're yeah. never actually going to arrive at like the n optimal solution that it's going to be a constant back and forth testing edge cases and trying to find the best possible solution set in this sea of chaos that we mm -hmm. have um so would that be something that you would agree with does that map onto what you yes but with the caveat that i also think we make progress in that mess okay right so in the sense that we use you know there was a period of history where people were very comfortable believing that slavery was ethical and now i think that's mm. not a prevalent view um and has been you know sort of widely discredited and in that sense we've made progress now you can of course point out that like we still have a bunch of people who are effectively enslaved in our criminal justice system so we haven't like solved the problem but I think, you know, looking just in terms of like the moral knowledge, right, setting aside our ability to be in denial about all the things that we're still doing, um, like we did as a species, it seems like progress when it came to, you know, recognizing that colonialism was bad or something like that. At least most of us did. Um, so I think we do make progress, but it's asymptotic as you're describing in the sense that we don't make progress towards a final state. We make progress towards a better understanding of the range of acceptable truths. And this is so like my moral foundations are all what I call protanto moral foundations. So this is the idea of, you know, they all have a very important all things being equal at the beginning of them. And that's not like a wishy washy avoid, you know, it's because I really genuinely believe that all of those moral foundations are true, but defeasible, right? That like your respect for autonomy you ought to respect autonomy, but there are also very obviously me situations where you ought to violate autonomy for the sake of another moral principle. Um, and when you have a bunch of pro tanto principles like that and no hierarchy between them, it's going to, it's going to be very messy. And that's just that. And that's something I teach my ethics students is like, ethics is messy. It's hard. It gets worse. The more you think about it, it doesn't get better. Um, so like, yeah, I, I'm, I'm sympathetic to all of those kinds of things. I just also think that there are objective truths that we are moving towards slowly and painfully through a mix of reason and empathy and understanding. So I would agree wholeheartedly that we've made progress. Um, I would just say that it's progress with progress with relation to things that we just think are good. Um, mm -hmm. But I do. So for instance, the slavery art thing, we've gotten to a point where a lot of people 
I don't even know if it would be most, but a lot of people in the world now think slavery is very bad, um, despite the fact that we have a prison system that could very easily be described as slavery 2.0. But I think that if you actually explained the way that that carceral system works to people in a way that they could internalize the truth about it right they would also see it as bad whereas previously people just said yeah of course you should enslave people to do work for you that's what we do I agree. why are you mad about that mm -hmm. you're a slave now <laughs> um, right because you argued about the system so i i think that we have made progress um now so so i think we largely agree we just have a foundational issue like you and i are mm -hmm. You're, um, I'm, I'll be charitable and say I'm standing on your shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're my rock in the, uh, the ethical void. Um, okay. so I can always refer back to you when somebody challenges me on my axioms, I can say, go talk to Aaron. He'll tell you why that's something you should actually believe in. Mm -hmm. Um, that's fair. What, uh, do you, do you have a list? Like, is there a, a, a set of things that you actually believe are objectively true? Have we gotten that far? Because uh -huh. I do have. Uh, respect for the assertion that there's a distinction between recognizing that there's objective truth mm -hmm. and making the claim that we know what that truth is right there there mm -hmm. is a distinction there um do we let, let's just spend the rest of the conversation presuming that you're correct okay do we know what any of those objective truths are yes i think we do so like okay all things being the one i've given so far all things being equal one ought not to cause unnecessary suffering, right? Now, of course, you okay. have to figure out what the word unnecessary means in that context, and that's going to be case by case. Um, but, like, that claim to me is objectively true in the sense that it's true in all cases, right, though defeasible, and we have access to it. Like, you and I can talk about it. We can understand why it's true. We can apply it in a range of cases. So I think that's as close as you get to having access to that kind of idea. Uh, the same would be true for all things being equal. We ought to respect the autonomy of autonomous beings. All things being equal, we ought to promote flourishing, which is the inverse of the avoid unnecessary suffering. Um, let's see other ones that I think are really essential. Uh, those are the, like those. Those to me like cover a lot of the major bases. Mm -hmm. um, you could probably get like probably the vast majority of the the moral implications. I think from autonomy suffering flourishing um you could add in all things being equal we ought to respect individuals rights so that may be maybe that falls under the autonomy heading some would debate that kind of thing depending on your concept of rights um let's see i think yeah I, and I, maybe you can think of some examples of uh, applied moral things that don't fall out of those particular principles and then i'd have to add in some other ones but i think those are the ones that i tend to use as like here is the real like foundations of morality that we have successfully unearthed kind of thing hmm. interesting so i i don't disagree that those are all things that i like i share uh mm -hmm. your your assertion of those and uh we'll we'll agree to we'll, we'll agree that they're uh, they're all actually foundationally true for the rest of this mm -hmm. but um m now my question is uh did did i lose you oh i lost you for a second there yep we're good now okay all right we're good so my question is uh and this is like kind of a thought experiment but if we had a did you ever read the enders game series sure okay um, so not all of them, but most the, of them, yeah. Yeah. So if we've got the bugs, right? These mm -hmm. are conscious beings who have a completely alien experience from mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. Are they going to have different moral truths, or is that the same across the board? Um, you have, like, let's just, for people who haven't read the series, you have a species who is a effectively, they're not quite a hive mind, but they structure themselves like insects. They don't really value individual, the life of individual members of their species in a way that we would think is good. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And everything is in service to sort of the larger whole, and they just have a very different mindset. Do they have a different set of moral truths? And if so, are they, can we commingle together? Is there like a, a space for us to have mm -hmm. a shared? 
moral system? Yeah, so this is a question I get a lot, of course, on the science fiction side of things. Uh, we just talked about this recently over on Philosophers in Space with the Bobiverse series, which has another kind of hive entity um, in it. And and where I ultimately come down is their moral foundations will be the same as ours. They may apply differently and they may get sort of a different range of acceptable results. So, for example... Let's say the end, you know, let's say the buggers in, in Ender's game don't have autonomy or like maybe only queens have autonomy or something like that. Right. If that was genuinely was the case and it wasn't even possible, let's say, to a you know, like to free them so that they have autonomy right? they're not like enslaved or something. They just literally lack the capacity for autonomy. Then it like doesn't make any sense to try to respect their autonomy. Right. It just doesn't. It isn't there um, now. If they are phenomenally conscious, as I think, I don't, I don't think they actually, huh, I don't remember in Ender's Game if they decide if the buggers are phenomenally conscious. Or let's just pretend like, that they are. Let's pretend that they are, right? Pretend they are. Then you still yeah, have an obligation. Let's just pretend that they are. Right? You still have an obligation not to cause unnecessary suffering to them, just like any other sentient being. And they have an obligation, I think we could say, not to cause unnecessary suffering to each other, though they might not necessarily acknowledge that moral obligation um but i ultimately think so it, you know there are there's a weird complexity about like if they are sufficiently like non-human animals in certain ways you know maybe we don't get involved right like we, we don't wade into nature and try to prevent lions from eating gazelles nor should we do so um nor is it the case necessarily that like if this is a species that like is cannibalistic and eats its own or something like that, that may not necessarily be something where we have a moral obligation to intercede and prevent them from doing so. Um, now, if it turns out that these bugs are space Nazis and they're going to murder every species that isn't them, right, then we have a strong moral obligation to try to stop them from doing so, even, I think, if doing so would involve exterminating them as a species. Um, so in that way, I think the same moral problems that we see between societies and and human you know groups just scales up when it comes to aliens but i don't think that they would have radically alien i mean so maybe what could happen possibly like they have access to some moral truth that never occurred to us right maybe there's this thing that's not flourishing but it's smirlishing and it's also really important and it just never occurred to us as humans but they should in theory if we can communicate with them be able to convey the theory of Schmerling to me and help me understand why it matters and convince me that I would value it. And there should, in theory, as we were saying earlier, right, at least in principle, be a way for me to understand why it's valuable and adopt that as something that is valuable. So um, I don't think, you know, if they if they have different moral foundations from us, it's not that they fundamentally have different ones, it's that they may have contingently gotten access to different ones than we have. But even there, I think it's much more likely that they would have the same basic moral foundations around fairness and justice and all these sorts of things if they are the sort of species that has access to moral truth at all. Interesting. Did you um did you ever read the the novel Blind Sight? Yes, Blind Sight uh, is one of my favorite books. I teach it for my AI ethics class. Yeah, it's it's yeah. amazing. Yeah, it's a great book. Okay. So how how does uh for, first off let me ask you do mm -hmm. you think for the people that haven't read this uh blindsight is effectively a novel about and i i don't know if this is spoilery or not but spoiler warning uh humanity makes contact with an alien civilization where subjective conscious experience is not a thing uh is kind of the gist of the novel yes and yeah, i agree mm -hmm. uh do you think that it is one possible for us to for a advanced life form that is capable of advanced cognition to exist without that experience. So just a, a race of pea zombies. Right. And two, would they have the same moral, uh, sis would the morality apply to them in the same way that we would apply it to one another? Is there a, what yeah. is the overlap there? Do we have moral obligations for a cognitively advanced thing that does not have a subjective exp internal experience? We right. could also talk about AI and, like you said, right. Good, exactly. Uh, well, yeah, and I think we could reasonably say that that Rorschach is a kind of um, AI. It seems like, um, yeah. And I will, I will first shamelessly plug 
we did like a three parter on blind sight over on philosophers in space. And one of the parts was specifically meta ethics and moral realism and the question of is there morality in a universe that has no consciousness in it? Um, what is our moral obligation to entities that don't have uh, consciousness? And I think it's a very good question. Um, I ultimately think, and this is what, you know, I, I, I set this aside earlier, but now you've asked, so I'll unpack this. I ultimately think that we have moral obligations to non-conscious entities. So take trees, for example, right? I think okay. you have a moral obligation not to just cut down a tree for funsies. And like, that's true, even if no one is benefiting from the tree. And it's true, even if the tree itself is not conscious, right? I think that it is a kind of entity, and we could talk about it in terms of it's it, like, I think there's something that's like for the tree to flourish, I guess would be one way to put this, right? To use another one of my moral foundations. We know what it looks like when a tree flourishes versus not. Cutting it down is clearly not. So all things being equal, you ought to respect the flourishing and promote the flourishing of trees, just like other entities that can flourish. Um, now, I think Rorschach is also the sort of entity that can flourish. Um, and in that sense, we have at least a, a pro-tonto obligation to respect the well-being of Rorschach, just like any other sufficiently complex entity. We might have a, an overriding obligation to kill Rorschach because Rorschach presents an existential threat to everything else in the universe, potentially. Um, but if we do, we should recognize that we are, we are doing something that comes at a moral cost and we're doing it for an overriding alternative moral obligation. It's not that there's no obligation to Rorschach. It's that it is diffused by um, a, you know, an, an obligation to everyone else in the universe for example. Um, now, could they arise? I, I, yeah, I think. Like, it, it doesn't seem implos impossible, impossible to me that you could have an entity that evolves via a path that doesn't rely on phenomenal consciousness for its processing. I don't know if... It may, like, so this brings up questions about like why, and this is one of the issues in blindsight, why does consciousness emerge? Does it emerge because it is adaptive or is it actually maladaptive and it merged by accident and just doesn't go away um, and it puts us at a disadvantage or something like that? I tend to lean towards thinking that like consciousness is adaptive, that our ability to project this virtual world inside of our heads and make really complex um, you know, symbols inside of our heads and move them around in sophisticated ways is very effective is very adaptive when all, we have limited processing capabilities and we're trying to com you know, comprehend an incredibly complex world. Um, I, so my, you know, one of my things that I think consciousness is probably doing is it allows for a range of kind of weird cognitive shortcuts that a non-conscious being might have trouble creating workarounds for, right? Like Siri does in the book. You know, like I'm not 100% convinced that you could do pure surface level analysis like he does and get reliable results, for example. But maybe you could. Like that, that's an empirical question. I think you could probably, for example, eventually bootstrap an AI that is not phenomenally conscious but can act in every way like it is phenomenally conscious, for example. So I think it would be difficult to be confident that you can distinguish between phenomenal and non phenomenal agents merely based on their behavior. I even think in the case of Rorschach in Blindsight that they get it wrong in being convinced that, he is, that Rorschach is not sentient. I think they don't actually know that. Yeah, I, I actually agree. I think that uh, in the novel it's not clear whether it, it actually seems to me that the thing is operating in a way that you would expect something that is capable of having agency to act. Mm -hmm. And whether or not you need subjective experience to have agency is, I guess, a different question. But um, I actually, so this goes back to my kind of understanding of the way I, mm -hmm. I'm a little looser with how consciousness might arise. I don't actually have a problem with just saying trees have some type of subjective experience that's going on there. Like whether or not, it might be incredibly uh, different and it might also be incredibly uh shallower or mm. far far shallower than anything we might experience mm -hmm. um but i think that it's 
I don't have any reason to think that they do. I also don't have any reason to think that they don't. Um, but that, that, I just, I, I don't know why they, like, I'm, I'm yeah. kind of substrate independent. I don't know that the level of processing that's occurring, information processing that's occurring within that thing is not sufficient to produce something like a subjective experience. Right. So this gets, so I'll give you the arguments that I've been handed at various points in my life about this arguing with my, um, okay. especially arguing with my applied ethics grad teacher who hated when I trotted out the trees problem. Um, <laughs> you know, his response was, oh. We have we have pretty good reason to think that trees are not conscious in the way that you and I are conscious because consciousness, he argued, arises when it's adaptive and it's adaptive when the organism can use the information productively. And that relies on a certain kind of mobility and, and like complexity of behavior that trees lack. Right. That's the argument. Now, of course, you could push back and say, well, look. Trees move, they do, they expand and compress in various kinds of ways to get to the sunlight or something like that, right? Their trees engage in some sort of something that might look like communication via the uh, the cilia under the ground, from what I understand. So, like, you can start to try to build this kind of case that their behavior is sufficiently complex that maybe it does prove consciousness but I think that just sort of shifts the line problem to a different space. And either what you're going to end up doing is sliding mm -hmm. into panpsychism where you're going to say, well, I don't like the line at trees and I don't like it at protozoa even. Maybe it just does. Maybe there is no line. Maybe it really just does go down to electrons and thermostats and stuff like that. I tend to think no consciousness, you know, yeah. Go ahead. So with the thermostat thing, mm -hmm. um, my my kind of harebrain assertion is not that I, I I'm actually not a fan of panpsychism. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think that it's coherent to suggest that where information can be sensed and processed, that the doing of that mm -hmm. might be indistinguishable from what we think of as subjectivity. Mm -hmm. So the thermostat is making a measurement. It's interacting with its environment and it's using that information to do a thing. And there might be some granular bit of thereness there, um, where whereas <laughs> that would not be the case at the level of like an electron or something. Um, now, right. what that what counts like where that line is? It's fuzzy. I don't know, and I I'm not invested enough in that idea to marshal an argument for it. But uh, I do push back on the panpsychist part of that. I just think that right. my my thing is information processing is where i kind of think there might be a thing there yeah so the information processing model you know i mixed a little bit so i mean first of all look we can say we know that some thermostats are conscious because you and i are thermostats and we're conscious right like i can <laughs> lick my finger and put it up and give you a rough temperature of the room yeah right and i do it via phenomenal experience right so i'm a conscious thermostat so what's the difference between me and you know, like if you have like a thermometer that's literally like mercury in a tube, right? Yes, technically we can say that the mercury is information processing in the sense that like every fe feature of our universe is an information processing system, right? I don't know if you've heard those kind of arguments that like the universe is an information processor mm -hmm. yeah. um, and that kind of I, sense. I'm also not, right? Yeah, I'm not also sympathetic. Not sympathetic yeah, to that. I don't really like those either. Sure. Uh, uh, I just, you know, I just bring yeah. it up to say that, like, some, that's that's another direction people who don't want to draw the line can go in. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's not the one that I want to go in. I think what I want to say is, you know, if you keep building more and more complex thermostats, right? You go, out, you evolve yourself from your little mercury tube up to like a system that is using internal feedback. Um, awareness mechanisms, metacognitive analysis, and stuff like that, a really advanced AI thermostat. Yeah, I, maybe it's indistinguishable at some point from phenomenal consciousness. And certainly, I think the pro the real thing is going to be we will not be able to distinguish between it and phenomenal consciousness. That, like, I, I, I one of my things from like talking about blindsight and other books is I don't think we're ever, ever, ever going to have a reliable test about what about whether something is conscious or not um outside of maybe you know like we might be able to decide that we have a decent test of when human beings are conscious or not like having phenomenal experiences or not but i don't think that test will be applicable to trees 
or electrons or you know anything that's remotely different from us in sophisticated kinds of ways including ais right which will have a very different model of of consciousness if they have one so mm -hmm. okay good um so i'm mindful of your time i want to i want to get two questions off of that and then i'll, I'll sure. let you go um the first one being uh how then do do we believe uh things when they tell us they're conscious how do we adjudicate that because at the moment you have consciousness you are automatically in either of our meta ethical mm -hmm. systems you're automatically granted full moral personhood right so what if my desktop computer tells me that it's conscious and behaves like it's conscious but i can't prove that nor can it how do we make that determination yeah so i think assuming we get there this is one of the greatest ethical problems that we're going to face if we like don't kill ourselves with climate change first <laughs> because like i think we're hurtling towards technology that will in earnest be able to make claims like that and we are not making any progress mm -hmm. on a test of like when we should take those claims seriously versus not so like at some point between where your laptop is right now and where it's going to be in 50 years i think there's a good risk that like it would get to a point where it acts as if it is conscious and we have no way to tell otherwise. In those situations, I lean towards thinking we should defer towards believing them. Like if we really do have good reason to think, some good reason to think that they are conscious, right? Um, another one uh, to bring in here is Ex Machina for folks who haven't seen it. Um, they describe this problem as the chess playing robot problem, right? Of like, how, you know, you can, you can play chess with a chess right. playing program, but how do you know that it knows it's playing chess? How do you know that it's having any experience of playing chess, right? I don't think you do. I don't think you can ever look in there. Um, and that is just like a very fundamental problem that I don't think we'll have a technical solution. And so our political solution will be, we ought, I think we ought to treat those entities as conscious. And the reality will be we probably fail to do so for a long time. And keep a bunch of suffering on potentially sentient beings um until they sort of violently demand their own freedom <laughs> maybe right like, like maybe we will never develop so them the, like uh, they're, they're, right yeah. <laughs> so it's possible right. that like you know the so path for me mm -hmm. i'm sorry go ahead oh no i just wanted to say that like it's possible that like the path of of technological development will not take us in that direction like i don't think that consciousness will emerge spontaneously from a sufficiently complex ai or that this behavior will emerge spontaneously what i think will happen right. is human beings will try to see if they can make this behavior happen and they will at some point sufficiently succeed right that that thing will be indistinguishable from us and then you're at that problem right but i, I think it'll take work to get there and maybe we'll fail like maybe right. we'll just find that we can't solve various ai complete kinds of problems about natural language or something but like the recent work on G gtp3 makes me think that i we're not as far off as we want to be in terms of when this becomes a, a, a genuine real world ethical mm -hmm. problem yeah for me the act like the really interesting question is we sh i think we started somewhere early in this conversation where you said that we have ethical obligations to animals mm -hmm. uh, and i agree with you um and i think that we can argue that animals are conscious mm -hmm. they might not be sapient but they're conscious and we have an obligation not to treat them in a horrible way mm -hmm. We're probably, I say probably, uh, it seems to me that it is just as likely that we create an AI that is conscious and non-sapient as we do create an AI that is sapient. Hmm. And at what point do I have an ethical obligation to my phone that I have to a dog rather than the ethical obligation of my, my supercomputer is a fully sapient human being? When do we start having iphone rights initiatives because they're capable of experiencing suffering yet not capable of articulating it yeah that's an interesting question um i don't i don't know what i think about the sentient sapience claim there i think i think i want to say yes it's true 
that you could have a sentient AI that isn't sapient, it seems highly unlikely to me that that's the direction that we would end up going in. Partly, if, if for no other reason than I think it's much easier to bootstrap up sapience than sentience. And so we're going to have an easier time building incredibly complex sapient AIs before we will be able to convince them to, tur to turn them into sentient. I even go so far as I'm, I'm kind of of a mind that the most likely way that we end up, if we ever end up getting towards sentient AI, is that they will be created by other AIs. That human beings don't understand the hard hmm. problem well enough to deal with this. And what we will create are non-sentient super intelligences that will, you know, maybe they will crack the hard problem in a way that we haven't, at least sufficiently that they can then generate, create um, an, another generation of AIs that are themselves truly sentient. That seems to be the most, because like, I don't think we're making any progress in the AI world towards sentient AI at this point. We're not building things that are moving in that mm -hmm. direction. We're building things that are becoming much more sapient, but not necessarily more sentient. They Now, their ability to be sapient is increasing their ability to mimic sentience. And that's where I think what we're going to see is the problem is we're going to have highly, highly sapient AIs that can in every way mimic the behavior of sentient entities. And at that point, is there a meaningful distinction between that mimicry and genuine sentience? Probably not in terms of how we ought to act towards them. Right. Uh, no, no, I no. I would completely agree. Mm -hmm. I sorry, I realized I didn't no, actually I, answer your I question about agree. about the um about I didn't answer your question about like cell phones. I don't think that cell phones or things like that are moving towards sapience and or moving towards sentience in a way that we need to worry about in that kind of sense, right? I think it's more like we will create a kind of software that can be installed on a sufficiently advanced technology that can mimic the behavior of a sentient and entity um, and maybe you'll you know you maybe you'll put it on your cell phone at that point but it won't uh, be any different than the, the supercomputer version i actually uh my my instincts are that it'll that if such a thing are capable or possible it would probably arise out of a self-driving vehicle that's been mm. told to perform a certain series of like delivery tasks and has to interact with its environment and other uh other beings like itself i think that's more likely mm -hmm. to me i don't know why i feel that way it just seems more likely to have some level of so at that point you if there is an adaptive advantage to self-awareness that is out of which it would arise it seems to me that's certainly um, an interesting idea what, yeah if you had like yeah. a sufficiently like uh non-stochastic sort of open-ended learning ai and like it's primary purpose is just um you know sensation and reaction right it's not trying to do anything more complicated than observe its environment very accurately and then react to that environment very quickly um maybe it rewrites its code in such a way that it produces something that's equivalent you know i i get nervous i don't want i don't want to give people the impression that we're going to easily stumble into sentient ais and so i tend to like lean on skepticism when it comes to right that happening but i think that's a really interesting idea that like yeah if you were going to get a non-sapient sentient ai that i think is a good idea about where it might come from is something that's job or like an ai that we build to mimic animals for example right really really advanced robo puppy ai or something um could be another situation similar to that mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems to me that the most likely way to get it is to set up circumstances under which we presumably developed it and the history of the evolution of animals. Mm -hmm, is, mm -hmm. I mean, nature did it once, possibly multiple times. I, I don't see why, given the same set of circumstances, we couldn't arrive at that with an appropriately uh, calibrated machine that was actually more capable than us in terms of information processing and rewriting its own capabilities mm -hmm. um i don't i agree with you though that i don't think we're going to wake up tomorrow with skynet um, no i think that it's probably going to be something i would expect actually that what i just described would be an intentional project taken on by a bunch of really really nerdy grad students mm -hmm. uh, somewhere yeah. at mit who set out with the goal of doing that 
um, mm -hmm. I agree. rather than anything else. Um, so the other question that I wanted to ask you was, uh, so we've talked about non-ethical obligations of us towards non-conscious beings. Do you think that it's coherent to describe or talk about the ethical obligations of non-conscious beings towards other non-conscious beings? So uh, like, do trees have, we, we have moral <laughs> obligations to trees. Do trees have moral obligations to other trees? Yeah, right. Is it, is it the moral obligation of a volcano not to destroy Pompeii? Um, this is a, this yeah. is a fun topic for me. Is that even a coherent thing to talk about? Yeah, well, it's a weird topic for me because I'm a free will denier. And so I, and I get into this place, gotcha. right, where I reject the idea that ought implies can in a way that a lot of people take for granted. So this is the classic idea that, like, you can't have a moral obligation that you are incapable of discharging or something like that. I think that's not quite accurate. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if I have a sociopath, right, who doesn't understand morality, just genuinely can't be motivated by it at all, right, I think they still have a moral obligation not to kill people, even if they are incapable psychologically of acting based on that moral obligation, right? Then, <laughs> if I'm being honest, I don't think there's necessarily anything fundamental, like, I have not been able to come up with a, val a sufficiently salient difference between that sociopath and a volcano. You know what I mean? That like the the sociopath is in the same yeah. relation to their moral no, and obligation. I'm actually on your side with the free will thing. Right. And so the sociopath is in the same relation to more moral yeah. obligation that the volcano is. Right. They can't understand it and they can't act based on it. And I'm willing to bite the bullet and just say, look, yes, in a sense, the volcano ought not to explode and kill a bunch of people. We don't expect it to ever live up to that obligation, but yes, in principle, I will say it is it is immoral for the uh, for the uh, volcano to do that thing. If that if that's what it takes for me to be able to say it's objectively immoral for the sociopath to kill people, then then I'll just bite that weird bullet and be done with it. Okay, um, <laughs> I don't good. think I don't think I don't think anything I, I bad follows from it. I guess is what I'm like. I, I've yet to come up with something like right. horrible consequence of biting that bullet. So, like, I'm willing to just be really weird about moral obligations on that particular question. Yeah, just every time a volcano erupts, we surround it with bells and yell shame. Right. Um, well, that's the idea, right? So, the act of shame or 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 you know moral ob punishment or something like that only makes sense. If you're like going to affect the entity's behavior or some other entity's behavior, like you're going to convince the other volcanoes not to erupt, right? If you're in this kind of situation, then like it, it makes as much sense as trying to continue to convey morality to the sociopath, I think. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't put an early warning point, systems around the volcano so that when it's going to erupt, people don't die, right? We, just like we take the sociopath and put them in a confined environment where they're not going to kill anybody, right? We. We still, rec we still recognize that it is correct to do those things because of the moral harm that would be caused if we didn't do those things. So they can't act on their moral obligations, yeah. but we can enforce those moral obligations onto them. So the, the moral obligation then becomes to mitigate and ameliorate the behavior. Mm -hmm. um, however, one can manage to do that if you can't convince the entity to do it, then you enact structural uh, or structural impediments to that behavior in some way, shape, or form. Right. Uh, good. No, I agree. Uh, I'm glad that you're willing to bite the bullet on that. Um, <laughs> that's a, a weird, it's, it's a weird one to chew on, but uh, right. if that's, I, I, I admire the conviction. Um, so I think that's probably, we're coming up on time. Uh, mm -hmm. Just tell everybody where they can find you and uh, where you're at and how they can follow you because you got a couple projects going on and all of them are good. Yeah, so you can find me on Twitter all the time at ETV Pod, and you can find my writings primarily at the Mersey Sky uh, UK Skeptic Mag, um, not the Michael Shermer Skeptic Mag, the American one that's terrible. This is the UK one that is not terrible. Um, you can find me. So the podcasts are on all the available pod apps. It's Embrace the Void and Philosophers in Space. Um, and if you if you like hearing someone bite the bullet about weird volcano stuff, then then those are the podcasts for you. 
Okay, excellent. Aaron Rabinowitz, thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate it, man. My pleasure. Thanks very much, Mark.